Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to host uh, and chair this very important and very timely event. My name is Tomila Lankina. I'm a professor of international relations here uh, at LSG at the Department of International Relations. And it gives me great privilege to chair this panel of distinguished speakers who, whose expertise and roles span both academia as well as uh, policy and indeed government service. And so they're uniquely placed to talk about the changes and debates about the defense and security architecture in Europe as these um, horrific um, events and the war in Russia's war in Ukraine unfolds before our eyes. Um, let me just um, introduce very briefly each speaker now, and then I will open the floor. And, and But first, I'll also give a couple of remarks from my own perspective as a political scientist who has worked on Russia for quite some time. So our four distinguished speakers are um, Tanya Latic, who is a policy officer at the European External Action Service. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Mykola Natovsky, who is at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev, an advisor to the foreign minister of Ukraine. Our third speaker is Dr. Simona Suare, who is a research fellow for defense and military analysis at IISS. Um, and we also have as our fourth speaker, Dr. Robert Ondrejczak, who is the Slovak ambassador to the UK. Each speaker will have about 10 minutes and then we will open up for uh, Q&A. And I should note that our first speaker would have to leave at six o'clock sharp. So um, hopefully we'll have, um, you will have a chance to ask her any questions and she'll have a chance to answer uh, them before, before she has to dash off. We're all extremely busy and kind of dashing on from one event to the next these days. Um, let me begin by offering some remarks from my sort of wearing the hat of political scientist who has worked on Russia. I'm neither an expert on uh, European defense and security, nor am I sort of a classic foreign policy specialist. I'm somebody who's um, analyzed Russian democracy, or rather what has been progressively uh, kind of debased and diminished over the, the 20 uh, plus years of Putin's rule. And as a political scientist who studied the Russian opposition movement, civil society protest movement, I have been writing academic papers, blogs, including policy oriented um, publications, kind of um, raising alarm bells along with other political scientists who work on, on Russia about the war that Putin has been waging against his own people. But unfortunately, in Europe, a kind of um, tacit consensus emerged over the years of, well, we can do business with Russia. Um, it is an autocracy, but you know, Europe can still prosper and there can still be security. Well, we've seen now that that approach just does not work. There can be neither prosperity nor security, but if, if we help perpetuate or do not significantly challenge um, autocracies like Russia. So we're seeing now the kind of security of implications of that approach. And what is really heartening to see is the amazing and incredible show of European and transatlantic solidarity with Ukraine. Um, and this solidarity has come about in the face of these events. Uh, and, and that is something that perhaps we should um, also discuss in the Q&A that, yes, it is a story. Uh, we should focus on what Europe and the West can do in terms of defense and uh, bolstering security architecture. But we should also talk about normative questions like uh, sustaining and helping and enabling democracy to flourish um, in, in countries like Russia, because ultimately, um, European, um, you know, European states are uh, in, will 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 suffer from, you know, from um, uh, this kind of erosion of democratic values in in and in, in political uh, regimes in uh, their neighborhood. So I will stop there, and um, uh, give the floor to our first uh, speaker. Um, Tanya Latic, uh, who is a policy officer at the European External 
um, action service. Tanya, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, well, first, I want to say thank you very much for inviting me. I'm super glad to, to be here. I think the timing and the scope of, of your event are both really spot on. Um, this event, I think, is asking the very questions that EU, NATO and G7 leaders are asking and trying to answer themselves today in, in Brussels. Now, I'm speaking to you today from a hotel room in Paris. I, I've escaped a bit the cemetery in Brussels, but I will still give you a Brussels or an EU uh, perspective on the on the questions that we're asking today. So we're focusing quite a lot on threat assessments and on the new security landscape that we have in Europe. Um, and also, I think this is very timely because the EU has just adopted its strategic compass. EU foreign and defense ministers just on Monday have adopted uh, the strategic compass and EU leaders are set to endorse it uh, tomorrow. So again, very, very timely. And this is also what I'd like to elaborate uh, on today. Now, first, for those who are not EU nerds, I would also like to very briefly explain what exactly is a strategic compass. The second, I'd also like to explain why it matters, why it's crucial uh, for our threat assessments and for setting the direction of the EU security and defense policy. And then third, I will also uh, touch upon how um, the war in Ukraine has impacted uh, our security and defense strategy. So to begin, what exactly is a strategic uh, compass. In a nutshell, it's a strategic document that sets out a vision for the EU security and defense uh, policy in the, in the next five to 10 years. Um, and what's special about it is that it sets concrete goals with over 60 actions and with timelines to deliver on this vision that it has put forward. And the starting point um, for having such a strategy in the first place was that the EU is facing increasingly complex threats. Um, and that, well, the most effective and the most efficient way of responding to them and dealing with them is by acting together. And the whole process has started in 2020 with a very first step being a threat analysis. So this is, I think, particularly relevant given the questions of this event. And it's a big deal, uh, for us at least. It's a big deal, um, first, because it is an objective intelligence-based analysis, an assessment um, made of a compilation, if you will, of Intel products um, and Intel analyses from each of the 27 intelligence services, providing an assessment of our medium to long-term threats and challenges, the threats and challenges to European security. The crux about it is that it's objective and intelligence-based and not political. So it has not been touched by diplomats who are negotiating commas and, and synonyms and what wording, no, it is objective. Uh, so that's why, that's the first uh, reason why it's important. The second is that it's the very first time that the EU does something like this. We haven't done it before, um, but it will certainly not be the last. Member states have been extremely positive about this and um, we've already actually started slowly working on revising the threat analysis that we've done in 2020, because obviously a lot has changed since then. So the, the threat analysis to um, contextualize a little was the starting point of the process and it sits at the basis of what we call the strategic uh, compass. And in a nutshell, the compass is our security and defense strategy that provides this shared assessment of our threats and challenges and sets out these new ways and means to become for the EU to become a stronger actor in defense. So that was on the compass. Second point, why does it matter? Why exactly is this compass important? Well, the EU has been working, I think, quite hard, especially since 2016, to develop its posture as a security and defense actor. And with the strategic compass, the idea is to bring all of these different strands and achievements that we have had in the past years, to bring them all together, um, to form a reflex of thinking strategically at the EU level among EU members and to make the most out of the EU framework. So what is the added value of doing things in defense at the EU at the EU level to scale up everything that we've done so far? Now, we've had security strategies in the EU before, it's true. And to be frank, they haven't amounted to much in terms of delivering concrete uh, capabilities and results. So this time around, our ambition is to make it count. Uh, obviously, we don't need, no one needs yet another policy paper for dust collection, that is clear. Um, so this is where I think the compass is different and why it will be different. 
it's actionable. It, it has concrete deliverables with these 60 plus actions that I've mentioned. It has concrete deadlines. And perhaps most importantly, the fourth reason is that it has political ownership adopted by ministers and endorsed at the highest possible level. This is the most political ownership you can get for such a document. Um, the compass is structured across four main pillars, if you will. I will briefly outline them. The first pillar is called ACT and it's, it looks at our ability to, to quickly and more robustly uh, be able to react when crises uh, erupt. So it, it's focused very much on crisis management. The second one is called secure, and this looks at how to guarantee the EU's access in what we call contested strategic spaces and basically everything that fits under what we call now the large umbrella of resilience goes into this chapter. The third one is called invest which looks at spending more and spending better uh, on defense, on tech, on innovation. The fourth chapter is called partner. And as the name suggests, it looks at how to better tailor our partnerships and think more strategically about our partnerships. And these are the four main axes that outline the actions that the EU needs to do to respond and to adapt to this new uh, threat environment uh, that it is facing in the next year. That was on the compass and on why exactly it's important. The third point that I wanted to make here, and this connects a bit more to what Tonira has just said in the introduction, how exactly has Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, impacted the compass? Well, in short, obviously a lot. It has impacted it a lot. Um, it's impacted a lot, particularly when it comes to the diagnosis of our strategic environment uh, and, well, and the long-term perspective of our strategic environment. Russian tanks were obviously not only advancing in Ukraine, they were also very much trampling on the European security order as we know it. So the Compass is certainly not shy in diagnosing this and in calling it as it is. It's a tectonic shift in European history. That's what it is. Um, the Compass very clearly recognizes that Russia is a long-term and a direct threat to uh, European security. It's there, black or white. So the impact is clearly felt there, but on another dimension, I think the impact was also felt in terms of the urgency that Europeans felt to deliver on these 60 plus uh, actions that we propose in there um, and to demonstrate through that our resolve and our unity, which was again mentioned. And in this context, I think I must also join the list of EU officials, which you may have heard in the past weeks, uh, mentioning the huge milestone that has been achieved with our actions under what we call the European Peace Facility, which is kind of a special pot of money that the EU has set up, which is running since 2021. Um, over a very intense weekend, a couple of weeks ago, just under 24 hours, and I can testify to that because I was also working on this on that that very weekend, the EU has agreed to provide 500 million worth of military equipment to Ukraine. This was a huge taboo that was broken, something that the EU hasn't done before and something that in normal times would have taken months, if not years, to, to achieve. And just yesterday, just yesterday, again, very timely, um, the EU has agreed to double that amount. So to provide 1 billion worth of uh, military support to Ukraine. And that is just on the military side. I'm saying this because I think the overall tone, um, vision and ambition for what the, e, what, what the EU can achieve in defense has changed as a result of that. And I'm trying to be a bit careful here to not sound too uh, self-congratulatory. I think that's a bit of a, of a danger here because I think the circumstances under which this occurred have to be remembered and they are truly horrific. So I think we have to also be a bit, a bit careful about our language. Now to conclude, besides telling you about the compass, I think so much has happened in these past weeks that it's a bit difficult to truly comprehend these tectonic shifts, as, as we call them, that have taken place and to make proper sense of the, of the long-term implications that they bring uh, for European security. I've already mentioned the historical decision of the European Peace Facility, which again is only military aid. The EU has done unprecedented stuff when it comes to macro-financial assistance, sanctions, humanitarian assistance, and refugees, purely on the military side, next to the European peace facility and the military support we have uh, given, the EU has taken a forefront role in coordinating 
the brunt of the military aid provided to Ukraine, not only by EU members, but by NATO members as well, by NATO nations, by the United States, by Canada, by Norway, by the UK, and also by New Zealand, Korea, and so on, several other partners. The EU is doing this, which is again a role that no one would have really thought of before for the EU. So again, something that we have to reflect about. What does that tell us about our ambitions? We, so we saw Germany made, making the headlines over a huge U-turn in defense policy. We're hearing about Denmark rethinking, it, rethinking its opt-out in EU security and defense policy. We see Finland and Sweden seriously considering their NATO membership. And we also hear Ireland holding a national debate on their neutrality. In a nutshell, there are these are tectonic shifts for European security. That's what, I, what I'm trying to say. And I think this is why for EU members, a strategic compass now is more needed uh, than ever. And I don't think this is an overstatement. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, hopefully that gave you a bit of uh, some ideas of what we're trying to do in the EU. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tani, for a very uh, thought-provoking um, kind of uh, set of comments, which I'm sure we'll have lots of questions and will kind of stimulate uh, a good discussion um, at the end. Let us now move on to our second speaker, Dr. Mikola Gnatowski, who is at Tarashevchenko National University in Kiev and advisor to the foreign minister um, of uh, Ukraine. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, um, for giving me the floor and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to participate in this very, uh, very important discussion. However, I feel a little bit um, um, alien uh, uh, or foreign here because, uh, as, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer and uh, I'm an international lawyer and I'm, I'm, I represent a profession that uh, might be a very sad one these days when the, the very basics of uh, the very foundations of uh, um, international peace and security um, uh, which is which are based on international law have uh, been uh, so uh, uh, brutally um, violated by the Russian Federation. Uh, on the other hand, of course, the reason why I uh, recently uh, joined as uh, as, uh, as foreign ministry of Ukraine as 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 a special advisor to the minister uh, is because international law remains. Uh, one of the main avenues of, of response for international law to these, um, uh, to this, to, to this terrible war, and uh, actually to, uh, to to in trying to look for um, solutions to to, the, to these very new threats, which this um, today's webinar uh, is uh, um, is about. And uh, I was very uh, impressed by the uh, um, presentation uh, uh, of, the, of the previous uh, speaker because I, I think indeed the response from the European Union has been um, uh, unprecedented. It has been tremendous in many respects. Uh, um, as, as already mentioned, the efforts to help Ukraine with weapons, the efforts to, and the real, not just the efforts, but the, the real, very tangible help uh, that has been received and 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 will 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 still be received. I'm 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 sure about this. Um, and also the um, European Union's reaction to the situation of Ukrainians who were, who have been displaced and who had uh, to uh, leave uh, uh, Ukraine, um, trying to uh, save themselves from the horrors of of this war. It's it, this is an example of another absolutely unprecedented reaction. And of course. Very importantly, um, the, the the fact that Ukraine has already requested, uh, has formally applied for for membership in the European uh, Union is something uh, that um, uh, is also uh, revolutionary, and one would have never um, uh, expected these uh, to be happening uh, um, so soon, uh, only four weeks um, ago. So uh, all of this uh, is, of course, very positive and, 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 and heartwarming and, and the, the expression of solidarity, especially from the European Union and also from individual nations um, across the world, but primarily those who are members of the European Union um, uh, has been um, 
extremely, extremely um, uh, valuable. Um, so, all, all, so this is this would be sort of the positive, uh, the positive side. But um, uh, as, as as an international lawyer, again, I have to say that uh, sadly, uh, what we see now in uh, the uh, strategic and defense uh, landscape in Europe um, can be characterized from a lawyer's point of view as a complete um, inadequacy of uh, the um, existing institutional um, and uh, um, also legal uh, underpinnings, um, especially those who uh, those which um, were created uh, after the Second World uh, War. The collective security arrangements uh, have been utterly useless in uh, um, um, uh, in, in reacting to the uh, most egregious uh, violations of international law and, 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 and the biggest challenge to the international uh, order, peace and security in Europe uh, since the end of the Second World um, uh, War, the uh, United Nations mechanisms based on the um, Security Council, um, uh, Security Council's almost exclusive competence in matters of international peace and security uh, has proven to be hopeless, and uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm being slightly undiplomatic here, but uh, it's obvious that the situation when there's um, uh, uh, there's an aggressor state um, uh, who is waging an, an, an aggressive war, um, uh, trying to um, destroy um, entirely and to de to deny the the very um, uh, the statehood and 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 the very existence of a neighboring nation. Uh, is at the same time a permanent member of the European, uh, sorry, of, of, of the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, capable of vetoing um, any uh, any decisions on substance uh, uh, under Chapter Seven of the UN Charter, is uh, essentially the um, uh, this is the end of this this is the end of this system. And I'm not speaking just as a Ukrainian. I think this system has been in decay. Uh, for for decades, and now um, the the lack of any coherent response to to this largely inefficient system um, uh, has culminated in this um, uh, horrible war of aggression that is is be, is is being led by the Russian Federation against uh, against Ukraine. Uh, as regards uh, NATO, uh, well, it's just today that. Uh, the NATO, NATO summit is, is, was was ongoing, and Ukraine's president was addressing it. I think it's 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 also fairly clear that um, despite um, uh, actions taken to, with a view to strengthening security of uh, uh, some of the member states bordering Ukraine, the overall response from NATO in in many in as an organization, I'm not talking about individual members, but the overall response has been uh, uh, disappointing and uh, could even be in interpreted by some as um, as encouragement to, uh, for the aggressor um which is which is most deplorable so uh, it and, and, and that also raises questions now um uh, as concerns are being raised of of, of a possibility uh, of, of of Russia extending its uh, um, military action, to NATO member states, especially those uh, which are uh, assisting Ukraine uh, with weapons, or th those which are used uh, for for uh, transit of, of of weapons to uh, to Ukraine, uh, such as Poland, for example, um, that then it begs the question: uh, when NATO will be uh, finally ready to uh, to act? Um, is uh, uh, the fact of the nuclear blackmail? Uh, by the Russian Federation sufficient to negate any any uh, security arrangement that has uh, been um, in place in Europe and in the world uh, since the end of the Second World War, is nuclear deterrence about deterring collective security. It's not deterring wars, it's deterring security. And, 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 and that, and that is, is, is a major concern. Uh, the pre-World War II architecture of international law, strangely enough, is very much alive and kicking. And uh, um, states still uh, introduce individual countermeasures and uh, collective sanctions 
against the um, the uh, aggressor state. The uh, arguments of of an economic nature um, are being um, used, and uh, they are the, well even even if uh, uh, late, but still they 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 no doubt they are efficient in uh, um, in one way or another. And uh, um, as they're as they're strengthening, uh, I think uh, it's clear that the the, the clock is for, uh, is ticking for the aggressor. How much it, it uh, how how long for how long it is going to last? It is going to um, uh, be able to withstand those sanctions. Um, of course, the w very weak sanctions introduced after the 2014 uh, beginning of the aggression and the. the Illegal annexation or attempted annexation of of, of Crimea and 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 the the occupation of uh, two um, uh, Ukrainian regions in, in in the east of the country, uh, they uh, have been uh, uh, they have produced an entirely opposite effect. They in fact encouraged the aggressor because they finally it, 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 which which saw that they can with this kind of response they can easily cope. So, th so this uh, this is this is uh, another another dimension to this, and I think the legal answers are very clear, and the legal answers provided by the UN Charter, uh, by the inherent right of the state to uh, individual, and I underline here, collective security is is a perfect legal basis for any collective uh, military action against the aggressor. There's obligations to prevent genocide. There's obligations to prevent other crimes against um, international law, which are also um, at play, which also provide a more than sufficient legal basis for any state which would like to fight alongside with Ukraine and which would like to um, uh, restore international peace and security uh, the only in the, in, 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 in the most efficient way, namely uh, militarily. So these, these are legal answers there are are not complicated. What is complicated is the security dimension. What is complicated is the political dimension, is the military dimension, and the response that um, could be produced um, to, uh, to, 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 to the nuclear uh, blackmailing of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of states. Because certainly if uh, uh, one side uh, pre at, at least pretends, or the aggressor at least pretends that they do not care about the prospect of destroying the entire planet. They do not care, they don't seem to care about the prospect of, uh, you know, nuclear winter and, 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 and basically uh, uh, putting an end to the, to not only to the civilization, but to, to, man, to mankind. But then, of course, uh, everyone else is at a loss what, what the response would actually be. And, and, and the responses which are being offered now, they, they appear to be one of the best possible responses but then how much would you uh, tolerate to uh, before you do something more uh, energetic uh, you need a full one needs a fully fledged genocide one needs more war crimes like in mariupol uh, in mariupol in, in, in kharkiv and uh, in chernihiv and, and in other major uh, cities of ukraine one uh, one needs to wait until let's say the capital of Ukraine Kiev is 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 is, is raised to the ground like Mariupol, or, uh, or 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 what 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 would be what would be the what would be enough uh, from the political and military point of view, not from the legal point of view, which is again um, uh, crystal clear in my view. So these are open questions, and op and I I think that um, efforts, including by the European Union, and has has just been discussed uh, uh, by Ms. Latic um, uh, that uh, to, 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 to look for new instruments uh, that would strengthen security is, 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 is most welcome. But of course, the, uh, there's, there's more strategic solutions and there's more uh, urgent uh, uh, issues that uh, need to be addressed before we actually have time to think about uh, further strategies. Let me stop here, um, and uh, I would be listening with great attention also to the following speakers, trying also to uh, uh, raise my own awareness of the dimensions that uh, normally uh, do not concern uh, people of, uh, of my profession. Once again, I thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to express myself here. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Natovsky, and also for giving us a very important uh, perspective from international law and uh, a legal perspective, which um, I think we should all uh, sort of keep very much uh, in mind when we when we discuss these these important um, questions. Uh, we'll now move on to the third presenter, Dr. Uh, Simona Suare, who will give us um, a perspective on the sort of emerging new paradigms in European defense architecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suare, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Lankina. And um, let me start by, by thanking um, LSE and the uh, Latu uh, Forum for, for the invitation and obviously expressing uh, my gratitude um, and um, what a wonderful opportunity it is to join you today in this discussion. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, con the context around the discussion, not quite so uh, uh, fortunate. Um, so the, the question I think that, that was posed to us uh, as panelists today was, well, how can NATO, how can the European Union create a security strategy that is effective in addressing uh, the very many complex um, uh, threats that we face? And the my, my quick answer to that question is they can't, and that is the reality of it. Um, it's only the member states acting together, including by using multinational platforms such as the EU and NATO, uh, who can indeed uh, develop such a strategy um, that can at least hope to, to, to address um, the threats we are currently faced with. But of course, Europeans in particular excel at developing strategy. Our, our uh, last three decades are filled with uh, breakthrough moments uh, in which we put forward strategies. We've had a security strategy before um, where we lack, unfortunately, and um, for, 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 for the time being, the jury is still out on the strategic compass as well, where we lack is implementation and follow through. Uh, and that is really where where the level of ambition is measured, especially if you're trying to assert that you want to compete, that you want to be a player in great power competition. It doesn't work just with words and papers. That's uh, sort of my reading of, of uh, uh, history and the history of great power competitions in particular. Uh, furthermore, I think that um, having a conversation among the member states about developing such a strategy involves not just a, a listing of, of the kind of threats that we are currently faced with, that is surely an important aspect of it. It comes with prioritizing them, uh, linking them to means and ends. Uh, it also comes with a little bit of honesty uh, to ourselves and to our citizens about which threats uh, are new, uh, including climate change and our efforts in that, including the technological revolution, and which threats are old and calling them as old is important. Even if this comes with political accountability from the citizens as to why haven't you seen this coming sooner? This is where uh, I would firmly put Russian aggression. This is the category where I would firmly put Russian aggression. And I think contending with that is incredibly important. So I think that to make the shift, to, to make the transformation that is required for us Europeans today to actually grapple with the kind of threat landscape that we are faced with is to um, accelerate a little bit uh, the learning curve that we have been through, we have been on for the past uh, three decades. And to me, this learning curve has six steps. Uh, one could call them the six Ds of European defense. And those are delay, deficiency, deter, defend, decouple, and develop. And they're not unique to Europe by any measure um, or to contemporary history for that uh, matter, but rather they're very much generally part of, of what historical learning curves are at the onset of great power competition and accelerating security dilemmas. 
Um, and what I would um, say is, and to briefly uh, go through each of these steps, is what I would say is over the past three decades, Europeans have mostly been stuck on, the, on step one and two. Uh, delay and efficiency. Uh, European states have uh, repeatedly postponed hard decisions about increasing defense spending, uh, increasing defense investment, be it in procurement, be it in next generation technologies. And what we ended up with were very much enduring and now obviously important deficiencies in our military capabilities. And those have not stayed still, but actually in the, in the greater context of Russian defense modernization and acceleration in Chinese and Iranian investment in uh, military technologies, um, they have actually uh, started to grow. And what we've seen with the Russian invasion uh, pattern, I would say, we've seen Russian invasion in Georgia in 2008. Uh, we've seen Russian invasion in Ukraine in 2014 and again in 2022. And this has culminated with, you know, bits of sovereign territory being uh, uh, taken apart, illegally annexed, or being left uh, somewhere in the middle of some sort of test beds for instability and conflict, if, you, if you'd like. Um, and I, I'm afraid that we're not still at the end of that acceleration trend, and we might still see uh, and be pushed into new uh, concerning directions, being be it uh, the full loss of sovereignty by a member of the uh, United uh, uh, Nations or, or uh, escalation to the use of, of uh, um, chemical and nuclear weapons on European territory, which would be indeed unprecedented, and that's not mincing words. And if this is not breaking the seal, I mean, I fully agree with uh, 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 Professor Mikola. If this is not breaking the seal of illegal and aggressive behavior from Russia's actions and us calling a spade a spade, I, I'm not really sure what else would. But what does this mean for Europe? Um, and in my view, what this means for Europe is that we are now finding ourselves in a position where we have to rush through uh, the other steps of our learning curve about what it means to be in great power competition, to at least aspire to be a great power or keep up with the competition uh, more generally. And that means we need to really accelerate uh, uh, through deter, defend, decouple and development, develop. And I'm not putting these in this order incidentally, but rather intentionally, and I'll explain why. So for me, the first thing to consider is whether the Europeans and indeed the transatlantic alliance at this point have actually been successful in deterring. Uh, deterring Russia from invading Ukraine and uh, deterring Moscow uh, right now from escalating the conflict. And um, objectively, the, the painful truth is that no, they haven't been uh, successful at this. Um, so one key aspect to consider perhaps is we're thinking about our strategy right now, whether in the European Union or in NATO, is how do we individually and collectively def def uh, deter more efficiently? What kind of levers of national power do we need, be it advanced technologies, statecraft tools, uh, geoeconomic tools? What, what kind of tools do we need to employ and how can we employ them more efficiently uh, against revisionists and aggressors such as Russia? What does this concept of modern deterrence that we need to you know, develop look like, uh, be it against conventional threats or hybrid threats indeed. And that is to, that is so uh, intimately linked to our ability as Europeans to compete in great power competition. I would argue that right now we're not competing. We're posturing, we're signaling, uh, but we're not competing. The second aspect that I would consider here is that we find ourselves as Europeans, yet again, um, forced by circumstances to defend, to defend ourselves and to try to help to the degree that's possible our partners. Um, and as we transition to uh, defend, to this step of defending, um, we see this in, uh, in the pledges that individual nations have made uh, to increase their defense spending. We've seen the same pledges in NATO and the European Union context. 
We've seen pledges to acquire new capabilities that are required for territorial defense. But the reality is that if we are as unlucky uh, um, as our partners in Ukraine have been, unfortunately, we will actually be forced to defend we, what, with what we've got now. And this is where our treading our, you know, taking our time, delaying uh, and allowing deficiencies in our military capabilities to grow will take their toll. Because the reality is Europeans are now under increased time pressure to develop the required military capability to meet not just the Russian threat, but a host of others. Um, and, and I think that with Ukraine and what the, the unfolding situation in Ukraine now firmly in our sights, it's also worth uh, asking whether our defense planners and decision makers are actually learning the right lessons from this conflict. Um, uh, lessons about you know, what to invest in to better prepare ourselves for the future, lessons about how to invest, to invest better in defense to prepare ourselves for the future. The third aspect that I would bring into the conversation is the trend uh, that is very much accelerating now, at least in relation to Russia, of decoupling ourselves from our adversaries. And this is not just a result of choices in Moscow and elsewhere, I would say Beijing, Tehran and elsewhere are uh, definitely in the same category, but also through our increased transition to using sanctions as um, preferred tools uh, that we can leverage against our adversaries for whatever uh, risks and threats that are coming our way. And this, the evolution in the sanctions regime, the types of sanctions that we are now imposing, um, and the frequency with which we lever sanctions against potential adversaries certainly indicates a higher degree of tolerance among Europeans and other members of the international community, like-minded members of the international community with this progressive economic and technological decoupling from our adversaries. Without necessarily recognizing that this you know, robs us of important leverage tools uh, uh, in the competition with them. And the final aspect that I want to underline here is develop. I cannot, under, I, I, cannot un, I mean, it cannot be understated or overstated, um, the fact that develop is key. The reason it's key is because we need it. We need to develop the military capabilities and state, state, statecraft tools that are needed to face um, a very different security environment that we have been used to uh, um, uh, over the past uh, three decades. But what does this mean? We've seen investments, historical investments in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, uh, pledges of increased defense spending. What does this mean? Where will it go? Are we trying still to plug capability gaps that we've seen unfold over the past three decades? Or are we prepared to invest smartly in new technologies that are going to give us an edge are we coming out of a uh, mindset of meeting tanks with tanks, or are we trying to outsmart our um, adversaries? Unfortunately, because we are in a situation where we have to defend right now, this is limiting European options as to what it can invest in and what it has to invest in in the short and medium term in order to be able to meet the minimum requirement of keeping its uh, uh, citizens safe. I'll leave it here and I very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soar. A very articulate set of uh, set of concerns that that we will we will be discussing uh, in the Q and A as well. I'm sure there will be lots of questions about some of the points uh, you raised. We'll I'll pass on now to the the, um, the word to our final speaker. Um, uh, this uh, Robert, um, Mr. Robert Andrejczak, who will give us a Slovak perspective on uh, European defense and the evolving uh, defense architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for having this opportunity to, to, to speak to you and to, to distinguish the audience today. Uh, I'm coming from, uh, I, I represent uh, Slovakia, which is a country at the very eastern flank of, of uh, NATO and European Union. Uh, 
so we have quite a specific or we are in quite specific situation at the time being uh, I just want to I just want to stress that uh, those changes which we are witnessing now in European uh, and transatlantic security architecture they they are not not new they didn't start 24th of, of February but uh, the, the, the roots are are coming from uh, from 2008 when when the Russians uh, launched the the off offensive operations uh, against against Georgia and it was uh, it was uh, in those times basically we were thinking that it's uh, it's something uh, which is at the periphery strategic periphery of Europe or geographical periphery of Europe. And probably it's not a systematic change in, in Russian foreign policy and security policy, even though the Georgians were, were warning us. Uh, the next step was 2014, when when basically uh, Russia Russia um, invaded Ukraine, uh, Ill illegally annexed uh, Crimea, and and uh, launched uh, operations and war basically in in eastern Ukraine, in Donbas which basically undermined the basic pillars of the European security architecture. First of all, uh, that uh, uh, we are not using uh, military force uh, in order to achieve our uh, strategic objectives here in Europe, and we are not changing borders uh, by force. So, uh, and obviously, uh, the, the European and the transatlantic answer was uh, quite strong but i believe that not strong enough so the russian decision makers uh basically evaluated the situation that that uh, they can move forward uh even though uh some countries in in our region or countries of our region the baltic countries poland other central european countries romania and and, and some other countries we were we were trying we were trying to to um say that that uh, there is a there is a trouble uh but uh, we were called alarmist <laughs> sometimes uh so unfortunately un unfortunately we were right and we are not happy about this but uh, now we are in a situation when when uh, we are witnessing the the biggest conventional war in europe after the uh, after the second world war a war when when uh, tens of, and hundreds of thousands of soldiers are are fighting uh, with with uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, artillery tanks and and uh, uh, other 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 military equipment. So um, it's something which which definitely has changed the the European approach uh, and also the the transatlantic approach towards Russia. So everybody understands now that this is a systematic change and this is a long-term change. So it's not going to, it's not going to, we are not going to, uh, we are not going back to, to status quo ante because simply it's impossible. Uh, and and uh, I'm very happy about the, the decisions of, of decision of the of the NATO countries today. The the um, uh, from from the summit. Uh, I'm especially happy because uh, there is a decision about uh, the creation of, of a new military uh, presence in, in our countries. Uh, as you probably know, after 2014, uh, in three Baltic countries plus Poland, the alliance established uh, the so-called enhanced forward presence. But in uh, in Slovakia, Hungary, uh, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, we didn't have uh, any any uh, significant uh, military presence from um, from the Allied states. Uh, now it has changed, obviously. Uh, in case of Slovakia, uh, uh, basically several NATO members are, de are deploying troops to our territory, namely uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Slovenia, and the United States. Uh, in, in a newly created or within a newly created battle group, which will have a, uh, which will have approximately 2,000 2, soldiers. So this is one of the one of the most important results that that the alliance uh, basically uh, realized, or the member states basically they realized that that uh, this strategic gap and military gap which we witnessed uh, in in our region is unbearable anymore. And in order to be able to defend us in, in an efficient way we need some some military presence so this is the first pillar which which uh, nato and nato members has to has to uh, had to do basically the second uh, 
also a very important pillar is to to help ukraine as much as we can obviously uh the the help is is uh being uh or the help is done in a, on, on a bilateral basis basically almost everybody almost every member of of the alliances is, is uh trying to help ukraine as much as as uh, we can uh so obviously uh, the the most uh Visible, visible help came from from the bigger, bigger NATO states, uh, from the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, but but countries from our region provided very significant help uh, if we if we transform it into per capita. So just another example, we we provided anti tank, anti air missiles to to Ukraine, uh, ammunition to to artillery, fuel, kerosene, and and other other uh, military and humanitarian help. So uh, this is this is uh, uh, second second pillar what what uh, NATO uh, did, and the third pillar basically that we try to to raise the cost still for for russia for this uh invasion um and here not only the nato but the eu played extremely important role uh by coordinating sanctions and economic countermeasures uh i believe that, uh, that those sanctions with the eu the united kingdom united states and other allies from japan australia and other countries uh basically uh introduced so those sanctions will will have a very significant impact on russia russia's economy and society uh some some economic analysis say that they will they will just push back russia's economy by 20 years um obviously it's it's not a goal it's it's just a it's just a tool to achieve strategic goals and the strategic goal is to is to force russia to to stop this stop this uh, operation and aggression against against uh, ukraine uh, it's very important to say that beyond beyond uh, those military military and and economic measures there are other uh, very important factors in 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 a wider uh, central europe and not only central europe but also in baltic region uh, this is the the change of the public opinion and uh, the opinion of the societies in general. Uh, I can start from the far north, uh, from Sweden and and Finland, where the societies are more and more inclining towards uh, NATO membership because they simply feel uh, threatened by by uh, by the Russian aggression and rhetorics. But also in in uh, in our region uh the the supporters supporters of of active nato membership just grew uh very very significantly um obviously it's it's uh it's a direct consequence of of having war next to next to our next to our neighborhood um just one example how close the war is to to slovakia so some some russian uh strikes uh to ivano frankovsk and, and other ukrainian uh cities in in western ukraine uh were approximately or less than 200 200 kilometers from from our borders and uh one of the biggest uh cities in in the very west of of ukraine ushgorod has an airport and the and the uh, and the airport is located just directly at the the Slovak border, Slovak-Ukrainian border. So far, there were no strikes on on this airport, but the runway finishes just 50 meters uh, next to next next to our border. So we we really feel uh, absolutely uneasy about about this. Uh, and moreover, obviously, uh, I mean, there is that humanitarian dimension uh, of this all uh, of war uh i mean millions of of people uh basically ukraine from from ukraine or ukrainians they they just moved to to towards the west or to to mostly to to central european countries uh to to slovakia we we offered shelter to, to almost 300 300 people uh we are giving uh free healthcare education um 
and and other other important things for for uh, a relatively relatively normal life even though it's a very bad expression obviously because because um, i mean it's very very far from 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 normal life if you need to run from from uh, from the war but we are trying to accommodate those people and to to help them and i know that uh, the other countries in the region they are they are doing the same especially poland where the biggest ukrainian community is, is concentrated at the time being so uh, just to just to sum up and and try to keep the the, the limits uh, the time limits um, this is this is a historical moment and and I, I understand and I know that it sounds very uh, like um, as, as very banal and very like, uh, big words or something like this but but uh, it's, it's the biggest event unfortunately uh, after the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1998 with a very long-term consequence on European security and uh, we need to understand finally that this is a this is a systematic uh, strategic element of the of the Russian foreign policy and and security policy and uh, there is there is very difficult to 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 find a way back and uh, I'm quite skeptical if, if, if um, uh, I, <laughs> the opposite, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even skeptical. I'm, I'm sure that that under the current Russian leadership, it will be very difficult to, to find a way back to, to normal relations. Um, and obviously, obviously, uh, I just very much hope that, that uh, Ukrainians will, will be able to, to uh, fight and resist uh, uh, in, in such a heroic way as, as they are doing now. And, and uh, our moral and strategic interest and goal has to be to, to help them as much as, as, as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for a very, very thought-provoking set of presentations. I'm aware that one of our presenters, Tanya Latic, has to leave in about three minutes. Um, but if you do have uh, a few minutes to spare, one of my questions uh, actually relates to some of your comment, the comments you made. But if you have to dash off, absolutely, um, that, that would be fine. I'm aware that you are sort of time pressured. But I wanted to um, sort of slightly abuse my privileges of the chair and um, and uh, bring, it, bring in some, some questions that will hopefully kickstart a discussion. And, and I think I could sort of uh, place them all under umbrella of what uh, Dr. Um, Suare was discussing as, as deterrence. And these three sets of questions and comments um, are um, the sort of sanctions regime. And, and uh, I wanted specifically to, um, to pick up on what uh, Tanya was saying about the compass sort of rapid response and uh, mechanisms and whether the kind of very impressive and very quick reaction to imposing a very sort of wide ranging set of sanctions that frankly, a few of us expected of, of the EU to act in such a kind of efficient way in, in this instance, whether that is going to be an important part of the deterrence architecture and this kind of rapid response uh, sort of um, measures in the future, whether this is a model that they will consider. Um, a second set of questions we haven't really talked about is energy security, because we know that the uh, kind of energy dependence of some European states really weakened the, the possibility and delayed the sanctions and weakened the effectiveness of sanctions. So whether some of the speakers could talk about that. And a third set of concerns, which I would also bracket under deterrence in the future is, and perhaps this is something that is in the area of uh, uh, international law and, and uh, Dr. Gnatowski would be expert to speak about, what legal consequences for perpetrators of war crimes. And so I just wanted to, to throw that in and, and open this up and give you a chance to respond before I pick up some questions from the chat. Should I come in here? Absolutely, right. please. Perfect. No, thank you very much for, uh, well, for everyone's presentations. Very, very insightful. Lots of uh, thoughts that I, that I wish I could share, but the time is unfortunately limited. So uh, maybe a quick reaction to what you have said, uh, Tunila, because I think you, you raise an important question that is a million dollar question and it's difficult to, to anticipate, of course, but I think indeed EU decision-making in, in responding to the war in, in Ukraine has set now a very high standard, indeed. What EU 
decision making is is usually known for is the lowest common denominator, uh, not very ambitious because of that. Trying to you know to agree on the lowest common denominator that everyone, every each of the of the twenty seven can agree on because that's how we take decisions in the EU and foreign and security policy by unanimity. However, as someone who is very dear to me has said uh, in a in a different uh, conference, indeed we have the lowest common denominator, but when our mutual understanding and resolve and unity to act is staunchly uh, united, then this lowest common denominator actually becomes very high. So it's the lowest, but it can be very high. So this is indeed, I think, the standard that we now have to look up to when we take future decisions in, uh, in foreign and security policy. Unfortunately, we still use words and papers to express policy. One can only hope that, uh, of course, we will deliver what we say through these words and through these papers. Um, I think I've spent the best of my of my ten minutes trying to to show that the compass is not a wish list, but rather a very concrete to to do list. And I will not repeat myself on that. The hard work, of course, for us begins now with the implementation and also with keeping this very high standard of unity and resolve to, uh, to act. Our higher representative said it himself, the compass is by no means a point of arrival, but it, it's a point of departure. So let's see what, what we do with that, uh, with that now. Maybe just to, uh, as a thought to, to, to leave you with and to, to look forward to it when it comes to the compass, no other EU strategy so far, and I've mentioned this, has been adopted by ministers, foreign and defense, and endorsed by leaders. So this is the highest possible political ownership that we can have for a strategy. This is as much as we can have and we can do. So if this doesn't give us um, ammunition to, to, to keep people accountable and leaders and countries accountable for they've, what they've committed to and to, that what they've assumed political responsibility for, then I don't know what, what more uh, we can do. Of course, it's always easier to say why something won't work than find solutions to make, uh, to make something work. So my plea here is to, to work together because the spillover of the compass, if it is to, be, to deliver on its commitments, will go way beyond EU member states. There are concrete proposals there to support the resilience of Ukraine, of Moldova, of Georgia, of the Western Balkans, of Africa. It's about our common resilience and security and our partners' uh, resilience and security. So I can, I can only do my bit, show up to work, uh, try to talk to you uh, about this, do my bit and hope that the Compass will deliver for the sake of European and, and transatlantic security. So I, I'm sorry I cannot uh, stay for the, for the rest of the discussion, but I know it's, it is recorded and I will gladly watch it to, uh, to get more of your insights. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tanya, and for being with us despite your very, very busy schedule. So we really appreciate uh, your, your contribution. Thank you. So I, I will open up to um, the other participants if you have some comments or quick reactions to some of, to some of the questions I raised before we open it up to the Q&A from the... Um, I see uh, Professor Gnatowski's hand. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lankina, for, for this and for, for, for your questions. And I also had a look at the, the questions that are appearing um, in the Q&As. And uh, um, uh, so basically your question was, uh, to me, was, was on, the, on, the, on the responsibility of, of uh, uh, those who have committed war crimes. And, and, and there's, there's also a question on the international institutions created after the Second World War, to, whether they will survive or whether they, they need to be transformed. I'll start with your question. Um, uh, the, the, that's a whole new dimension, of course, uh, um, uh, which is uh, rarely discussed at uh, events which deal with security as such. But I think this, these, are, these are important things. And what's uh, well, war crimes, certainly, there's, there's, there's well known avenues. There's the International Criminal Court, uh, which has jurisdiction for war crimes and crimes against humanity that are being committed and have been committed in, in, in the course of, of, of Russia's war on Ukraine. Um, and one can only hope that the ICC can uh, be sped up and can, can receive more support from states and more incentive to, um, to move uh, quicker than it usually does. But there is one uh, issue which uh, directly relates to, to, to the issue of security, and this is the um, 
um, uh, international criminal responsibility for the crime of aggression, which is uh, that is for the violation of the foundational principles of um, international uh, law, namely the prohibition on the use of force. Um, uh, in international relations in a way which is manifestly uh, violating the UN Charter. And um, there, there is an obvious gap in the uh, institutional and jurisdictional um, landscape. And um, uh, and this architecture is, is, is not perfect because uh, since the Nuremberg trial, uh, well, and, and uh, a, a similar trial in, in Tokyo, uh, there hasn't been a case when um, uh, the, the leadership of the countries, uh, persons who could um, influence um, its policy, which led to, uh, to the crime of aggression, were actually held responsible um, and uh, criminally responsible. And uh, the efforts to uh, to uh, set this mechanism up within the International Criminal Court have been only partially successful. And it, for example, in the Ukrainian case, the, the International Criminal Court will not have jurisdiction for the crime of aggression. Russia is not going to ratify the required treaties. So, um, uh, which is which is why I think it's important to return to the experience from Nuremberg and uh, to um, um, uh, seriously consider, and I think it should be done, to, uh, to set up a special tribunal for the crime um, uh, of, of, of aggression against Ukraine. Um, use, drawing on, the, on Nuremberg's experience, this proposal has been made, it's been supported by the Ukrainian government, it's been supported by uh, former UK Prime Ministers, uh, Gordon Brown, John Major, and the, by leading uh, international lawyers also uh, of the United Kingdom, but also from, from, from all over Europe and, 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 and more globally. And, and this, this would certainly be a good idea, even if this would be a trial in absentia, which is a trial without the people present, uh, or I mean, the, the, the accused present, uh, in front of the judges, that is also one Nuremberg experience that that could be taken board. And this brings me to the second question. I will answer very briefly because I think the answer is contained in the question. Uh, indeed, the UN Security Council, uh, to remain relevant, it has to be uh, radically transformed. Because otherwise, it unfortunately it, it it makes no practical sense, and it makes it renders the United Nations helpless uh, uh, in the face of such a war of aggression. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll actually uh, now read out some of the other questions and, and thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Gnatowski for uh, actually um, uh, kind of responding already to one of the questions in the in the Q&A box. So I'll, I'll uh, read out the other one about, um, it's from um, William Ostatnik and it's about uh, Dr. S uh, Suarez comments about developing, deterring, defending. Uh, but also prioritization of capabilities. What are the most important niche technologies, tools, capabilities, or industries where the EU already has a strong po position, possibly a lead? If you could uh, briefly answer that um, that question, um, Dr. Soar. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, I would start by saying that in among the emerging and disruptive technologies that could be the underpinning of the next generation of military capabilities that could uh, result in significant transformations of how wars are fought in the not too distant future, um, be it artificial intelligence, cloud and edge computing, uh, hypersonics, um, quantum uh, further down the line, human enhancement. Europeans don't have a lead, are in the position to actually get their act together to catch up with uh, countries like uh, our close ally, the United States, or with um, uh, countries like China, for instance, who are very much more advanced. Uh, we are talking about, we have been talking for the past, I believe, uh, uh, six years now about um, investing and increasing in the digitalization of defense in Europe, about making our 
capabilities more digitally connected, more software driven, more uh, uh, inclined to or more built around open architectures. Um, which could enable us to exploit to the fullest potentially information, information superiority um, over our adversaries. But we haven't necessarily done so. Uh, over the past two years, we're seeing an increasing curve in um, uh, European investment in sensors and new types of sensors, which will presumably lead to greater digitalization, which will open the door for the deployment of artificial intelligence and other tools. But that is only likely to happen if we keep a steady uh, uh, and increasing investment in, um, in defense, in defense investment in particular, in R&D, not just in procurement. Um, I'm afraid that on that aspect, we're not quite there as Europeans. Uh, we are, our investment in R&D, in research and development and research and technology, has certainly increased uh, uh, since all time, well, since uh, historical levels in 2008, but they are, uh, by comparison to other great powers, they are very much low, very much low, still very much driven by national interests and national plans and national investments. Uh, that hurts the European approach or the what we've been talking about as the European added value in defense. If we don't spend together, if we don't invest together, if we don't develop these technologies together, um, national industrial interests are still getting in the way a little bit of that. And we're seeing that with uh, these kind of emerging technologies. We're also seeing that with respect to some of the strategic um, military capabilities that will underpin our defense uh, in the 2030s and 2040s, right? Be it the future combat air, um, air combat system or others. So we're, I'm afraid that we're still in a catch up phase right now with, with respect to um, these new technologies. And as I've mentioned in my introductory remarks, our need to respond to a very immediate and geographically proximate threat uh, is limiting our options and is limiting the breeding space and the financial envelope that we have available to invest more in these technologies that will keep us competitive over the longer term. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question on China. How do you assess EU and NATO USA uh, slash USA alignment vis-a-vis -vis China, not only Russia, more generally, how should EU treat China and what diplomatic tools to use and apply to deter Beijing from aligning fully with Moscow, especially uh, given the upcoming EU-China summit? Anybody would want to um, address that question? Yeah, I can. I can tell a few words if you if you don't mind. Uh, uh, obviously, China is China is a very important factor in this in this uh, triangle. Let's call it tri triangle: the West, uh, Russia, and and China. And uh, there were some some rumors or information media that that uh, the Chinese government is going to provide some some military or economic help uh, or assistance to to, to Russia uh, during this war. Uh, what what we can do basically is to communicate to to Chinese government very openly that that this goes against uh, against the the very basic interest of of, of China. Uh, and and it's not a good idea to to help Russia to bypass the the sanctions because at the end it can harm the Chinese economy uh, too. Uh, in a long term basis, both the EU and NATO uh, are are uh, defining China uh, as a as a in, in in a very how to say in a very balanced way I would say so as a systematic rival. As a strategic competitor, but also uh, also as a as an opportunity uh, 
partner so uh, there are some opportunities for for, for partnership so uh, it, it very much it depends on the strategic decision of the chinese government that uh, which way they are going to define for themselves uh, not only in this particular war but uh, in in general in in, in uh, uh, asia or in the pacific region and and uh, east asia uh, so it's it's one of the big questions uh, which which uh, the NATO countries are dealing with, and even today in the summit, uh, China was was included in the in the communique. Uh, so uh, it, you know, within within those uh, within the framework which I was I was uh, talking about. Yeah. Thank you. I see that Dr. Soare also wanted to respond to that comment. Question. Yes, if I can just really quickly jump in there. Um, I think that um, that is really a key question about looking forward as to the dynamics between uh, Russia and China. I wouldn't put it as an alignment of China with Russia, but rather the other way around, because I think that the economic and the macroeconomic dynamics in the two in this binome is uh, not necessarily pushing China closer to Russia, but increasingly pushing Russia out of necessity closer to China. And that is something that is incredibly interesting to, to observe, very consequential. Uh, it's something that both uh, the US and, the, and NATO in particular have been aware of and have been trying to deter as much as possible or to, to avoid, uh, deter is not the right uh, term here, but to avoid as much as possible. Um, but one of the key aspects that I see uh, and a key difference between um, Russia and China is how we measure our tolerance to the risk or the threat that each presents to uh, European security and defense. Um, I think that NATO, for better or worse, have got it rather right especially with the um, 2019 military strategy in the alliance. It's very clear Russia is the threat, is here, is proximate, geographically proximate to us. It has an immediate manifestation and it has significant consequences. Whereas um, China is a threat, but it, it, the manifestation of that threat is very much different and it might not necessarily or always uh, uh, require or immediately require a military response. So there we have to use tools that are perhaps more sophisticated for this kind of competition. I'm not really sure that the European Union is getting it right though, I have to say. I think that they're still um, uh, thinking that they can compete geoeconomically with China and isolate uh, the security, uh, uh, the security um, consequences of this competition. And uh, uh, of course, I don't have my uh, crystal ball with me to tell you how this ends, but, but based on a, a, a historical uh, uh, approach, a historical approach to how great power competition uh, goes, uh, then perhaps uh, hedging our bets a little bit more uh, would be the wiser um, uh, path to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Faisal Rahim. How receptive do you think the US will be towards the EU strategic compass? Should the EU US be concerned this move is the start of supplanting NATO as the bulwark of European defense? And, and I understand the our speaker about the specifically who discussed compass. She's she's um, left, but I see um, Dr. Andrejak, um, his hand uh, has his hand up. So, if you're happy to answer that question, please. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, that that question, that relation between EU and NATO in the field of security of defense, is is not new. It's it's uh, with us for, for at least 20, 30 years, obviously. Um, and they were there were different initiatives and projects and and policies within the eu uh, how to strengthen the the so-called strategic autonomy some projects are tailored even how to how to create some independent uh, uh, non-nato structures in in the field of security and defense some of those structures are are already existing obviously but the big question is not not uh, a bureaucratic one the big question is basically how we define european security if we define it uh, in, 
in in uh, in the opposition to the United States uh, as, as something completely independent, or if we define it in cooperation with the United States. And I believe that that uh, even those who were who were trying to to uh, choose the first path, I mean, to define the European security uh, in opposition to to the US, uh, even those those. Uh, representatives or experts or position they understood now after the after this Russian aggression that it's not a it's not something which is which is uh, desirable in Europe. Um, basically, the, uh, NATO was really able and capable to 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 react on the Russian ag uh, Russian aggression. Uh, NATO demonstrated basically the ability and and the will of, of the member states to to defend Central Europe. And there are many, many countries uh, within the within the EU itself, uh, without any desire to compromise the transatlantic link and the and the, um, um, the position of NATO as the most important uh, security provider in in Europe. Uh, I cannot imagine uh, I cannot imagine a situation when when uh, somebody now is trying to to weaken NATO. Uh, or to to strengthen EU uh, as a security actor on the expenses of on the expenses of of, of uh, NATO. So uh, I guess that this question is is um, basically answered. Time being, um, NATO will stay with us, fortunately, for for another decades and and uh, as as a primary institution of, of European security. It doesn't mean, obviously, that that we cannot strengthen European security. We have to, and we will. Uh, it just must be complementary complementary with the with the NATO. And uh, I believe that if Europeans are stronger, the NATO is stronger in in in, in general. So to to build a European a stronger uh, European security identity doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to destroy NATO. We just need to do it in a in a way which is absolutely which goes absolutely hand in hand in hand uh, with, with with NATO, and it, it's what 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 is happening now, fortunately. Thank you. I see Dr. Soare uh, also wanted to respond to this uh, to this question. Um, just uh, very, very quickly, I think that this is such a false dichotomy between the choice between the European Union and NATO, uh, for, for especially for member states who are, uh, uh, you know, participating in both. Um, and we only have, I mean, the, there's a thing, right, to say there's a single set of forces uh, for, for the defense of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe and the transatlantic alliance, and that is true. Um, you can't split them between uh, NATO and the European Union, um, and member states still have full sovereign ownership over those uh, forces and over the capabilities. So the issue is to look at NATO and the European Union as platforms. And and tools for the member states as to where they can better cooperate on specific issues. Now, NATO and the European Union are respectively better placed to address certain issues. NATO is not as well placed as the European Union to uh, deal with uh, geoeconomic and statecraft tools to fight, to, to counteract hybrid threats. Um, it's good on cyber defense, it's good on territorial defense, it's good on uh, uh, exercising, it's good on standardization of our military capabilities. So pushing through those strengths that each institution has and recognizing them is not a, a matter of competition between the two. Ultimately, the result is that Europeans and the members of the transatlantic community are hopefully more secure together. So, but uh, and in addition to this, to, to answer the question in the chat from from our uh, uh, audience is how responsive will the US be to the EU strategic compass? Well, hopefully it will be, but uh, it will be responsive. Uh, responsive. It will have a positive response. But you know, this takes me back to what Professor Lankina was saying at the beginning of our Q and A: is we have all been surprised by the 
a firm reaction that the European Union has put up in response to the, illegal, uh, to the invasion of Ukraine, the second invasion of Ukraine. I'm sure that our partners across the Atlantic are feeling that effect of surprise. I'm not sure how effective we are as a major uh, geopolitical player if, if our partners, even our partners, are surprised by our behavior. Um, this should be the staple uh, of that uh, geopolitical behavior rather than the exception. So hopefully they'll, be, they'll, they'll respond positively to the strategic compass. But, but uh, one cannot uh, erase uh, two decades, three decades now of, of um, concern in Washington that Europeans are still underinvesting in defense, that they are um, underinvesting in new technologies, that they are um, underinvesting in the um, uh, uh, training and exercising and the readiness of their troops for, uh, for situations just like this. Thank you. We have um, a, a question which appears to be a repeat question, or, although I didn't see it earlier in the in the in the Q and A box. Um, uh, perhaps the Slovak ambassador could answer why ex-Soviet jets and S-300 air defense systems have not been supplied yet. Why NATO acting scared by the imagined nuclear threat? Ways to provide humanitarian aid through quoting responsibility to protect. Um, could something, uh, uh, could, well, uh, could um, these questions be, um, be uh, discussed, please? I don't know if somebody wants to. Uh... Yes, uh, mm -hmm. if I may, it was a question about, about uh, Slovakia giving, uh, potentially giving those S-300s uh, air defense systems to Ukraine. Uh, we declared several times, and we are declaring it all the time, that we are ready to provide the, those capabilities to Ukraine. We just need to to have some some uh, something which which is going to replace it. I mean, uh, obviously we were we were supplying already Ukraine with anti, uh, I mean, with air defense uh, missiles, not S three hundred because it's more like longer range, obviously. Uh, but uh, simply we need to think also about our own security and uh, I understand that for somebody it can be selfish but uh, but uh, the case is that that uh, we, we, we we can provide those systems and and uh, we, we declared it our representatives basically several times they declared it openly we just need to we just need to manage somehow the replacement I mean uh, so to, to acquire to get, somehow a uh, system, an air defense system, which has the same uh, or similar or comparable uh, capability in order to, to keep our, our airspace uh, uh, protected, basically. So this is the, this is the answer. Um, I believe that those negotiations are still ongoing. And, and as, we, as we mentioned many times, we are absolutely ready to help and we want to help Ukrainians. Thank you. We have two minutes remaining. So I wanted to ask perhaps briefly um, the panelists if they want to uh, say a kind of brief uh, comments to wrap up the discussion before I think the system will cut us out automatically um, in two minutes time. So just very briefly, if you want to give some 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 final sort of reflection, something that questions that haven't come up that you wanted to address. Yes, very briefly, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lankina. There was another question um, um, on why NATO is scared with the imagined nuclear threat. And I would like to know the answer myself, because I think that uh, be, be, be get, getting this threat the way it is, it, is, it is taken now will lead us nowhere, because it will just lead, more, uh, to, lead to more concessions and to graver, graver problems. But th that's, that's my perspective on this. Once again, thank you very much for this excellent event, and I, I learned a lot today. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, any final reflections from the other panelists before before I also thank everybody for, for a really, really stimulating and thought-provoking discussion. I don't see any more hands. So before we were cut off, I think there was also um, uh, um, a reminder from the organizers that there will be a feedback form that participants are invited to complete or guests to this event. But Neil, I, I wanted to thank everybody uh, very much for finding the time in this really, really hectic. Uh, I know from my own experience that, you know, I've been going from talk to talk and it's extremely demanding and challenging also, not just intellectually, but emotionally for all of us as we are witnessing this, these horrific crimes and, uh, and events unfolding before our eyes. So thank you very much for, for joining us, uh, us in this event. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Professor Lankina, for your expert moderation. Thank you so much. Thank you to the other panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.